All right, you guys, um, I trust that you pastors are online and, and others are joining us. I want to welcome you to our Pastors Roundtable, the webinar that we've been hosting each month. And uh, we're very delighted to see that since the COVID uh, experience, we have seen this uh, monthly get together with you pastors here in the state of California grow to many hundreds. And we'd love to see that uh, even increase. Today, you guys, is going to be somewhat special. Number one, Gina Gleason, our Director of Faith and Public Policy, she's on vacation, a well-deserved vacation. So it's just going to be Dennis and I, Dennis Prager, and we are so delighted, Dennis, to have you with us. Uh, I can't imagine doing uh, these pastor outreach webinars without eventually having Dennis Prager, and I'm going to say why in a moment. But we are honored by your stand and your position for truth. It is often something that comes out of my mouth, Dennis, that I wish more pastors were outspoken and clear as you are about engaging the culture. And you, sir, recognize and understand more than most uh, of the profound issues that are in play right now, things that are in play that our country perhaps has not had a chance to deal with since its founding. And I believe that we're in a struggle for the very soul of this nation. So uh, pastors on this call, as I mentioned, Dennis Prager, uh, he's not only a graduate of uh, Columbia University, I think it's safe to say that Dennis's greatest education has come from him since that time engaging the cause for liberty and freedom. You just saw that video a moment ago on, on how a nation works rightly, capitalism and the ability to do that. And he is one of, if not the key voice uh, for what this nation needs to hear. And I'm not sure if he fully appreciates it or knows it enough from a Christian perspective, just how much we lean and depend upon his influence. His syndicated radio program is heard daily across the United States. He needs no introduction. Uh, Dennis Prager is not only a friend, I, I love this man. I love his wife, Susan. I love their family. I love that. I, I love all that's going on with them. And um, I, we're just honored to have you with us, Dennis. And I want to be sensitive. You just did three hours of live radio. And I'm going to let you be with us as short or as long as you're comfortable with. Uh, but the format's very simple. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, deliberately for you. Nobody else can answer these questions but you. And then, um, and then I'm just going to want you to have the freedom uh, to go eat lunch or do whatever you need to do. But Dennis, thank you for being with us. I love you, brother. I love you, as you know. Uh, if if all uh, religious figures were as strong as you, the country would be a very different place. Uh, I'll just say, and then, I, then obviously I, I want you to ask me whatever you want. Uh, if we cannot rely on the religious communities, then it's over for America. I am not at all one of these doomsayers. I, I have an hour on happiness. I wrote every week. I wrote a book on happiness. I am happy. <laughs> uh, I believe that it's a, a moral obligation to act happy, even if you don't feel it. God commands happiness uh, in, in the Torah. Uh, I, uh, I'm a big uh, fan of happiness, but I'm also a big fan of reality. You, uh, it really falls on America's Christians, the survival of this country. We're an experiment. Humans don't want liberty. This is a, a big boo-boo. People want to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be free. Freedom, as the founders understood, is a value, not an instinct. If it were a, a, an instinct, then we wouldn't have a liberty bell. We don't have a breathing bell. Breathing is an instinct. We don't have a take care of me bell. Take care of me is an instinct. Liberty is a value, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. The fact that the founders knew Leviticus, I, it always blows my mind. Uh, <laughs> if you would say Leviticus to the average American today, they might think it's the name of a horse running in the Preakness. You know, it's a, 
there's a three to one odds on, on Leviticus. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, obviously. It is the tragedy, the ignorance of the Bible. Uh, so you are the community that has to say, wait a minute, we march along with uh, different values. Our, our values are not the New York Times values. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and finally, it comes down to what do you fear? This is why it it's so often says, and you will fear God. By the way, modern translations, I know biblical Hebrew uh, pretty much like English. And modern translations almost never say you shall fear God. They say you shall revere God. Old translations have fear. Yeah. Our modern times, oh, no, no, we don't want people to fear God. That, that sounds terrible. Yet when the uh, midwives disobeyed Pharaoh, mm. they don't say it's because they revered God. It's because they feared God. They feared God more than Pharaoh. Uh, and I ask every religious individual, whom do you fear more? The internet or God? Facebook uh, 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 anger or God? The LA Times or God? That's what it, that's what it amounts to. Yeah. So uh, you're, you're my people. Well, Dennis, I want to ask you something you said a moment ago. So you're saying that uh, the Christian community at this hour is needed, the voice of Christian leaders. You being a practicing Jew, faithful, uh, with all that your people have experienced in life, why is there not more of a, of a Jewish voice than, uh, even more than pastors in America? Because your, your, your life, your people know what it is to lose things and to lose freedoms and to endure. Uh, why are we not hearing more from the Jewish community on what's at stake? Well, it's, it's, there, there are many, I'm, I, I will try to be as brief as possible because that could take up uh, the hour. And I, I, it's a fascinating question. I've dealt with it my whole life. My disappointment in the Jewish community is very deep. I just want to say that. I say it publicly. Obviously, this is public. I say it on the radio. I, I just want to note that one third of the Jewish community uh, th does, not, does not veer left. I mean, that's not, it's not great, but it's not min minuscule, just, just for the record. By, and and the, uh, your question, though, is better than I usually get, I, which is not a bad question, what I usually get. Why are Jews on the left? Which is a completely valid question. But you, have, you sharpened it. Given the Jews' experience, why aren't they calling out? And I'll tell you, I'll, I will now define your question. Nobody knows better or should know better how fragile civilization is mm. than the Jews. The most advanced culture in Europe built Auschwitz. It went, it, it, it literally went from Beethoven to Auschwitz. Wow. And, uh, uh, and it shocked Jews. Jews. German Jews were stunned. They, they were so proud to be Germans. They, they identified so deeply uh, with the, the, the German nation. And then they're sent to death with their kids. Virtually every uh, Jewish child in Europe was murdered. And uh, the, so the question, I, I, I pose what you pose. Hey, do you, want, you don't understand how fragile civilization is, my fellow Jew? That, and, and that we, what we're watching is the, the destruction of the pillars of American and Western civilization. Do you not understand that? Or, or further, do you not understand that the reason... Jews have had it so good in America is because of America's Christians, because of the honor in which Jews were held, mm. because we're Jews, because this is a Judeo-Christian society. But if it's no longer a Judeo-Christian society, Judeo doesn't mean a damn thing. Yeah, yeah, wow. So uh, the answer is that when Jews leave Judaism, uh, they adopt secular religions which is true for non-Jews. But you asked about, uh, about Jews, but it's, it's just as true for non-Jews. Uh, th these rioters uh, out there, you know, they're not, they're not particularly Jewish. And uh, th th it's a crisis. It's a crisis in all of religious life. 
I mean, I, you know, when I meet uh, uh, fellow uh, conservatives who are Christian, uh, or not Christian, just fellow conservatives, but if they're Christian, I, I ask them, and, and it's funny, they never, they never get offended by the question because it's sincerely meant. So how many kids do you have? Oh, three, four. How many of them uh, have your values? Almost never is the answer the same number as the children that they have. Mm. And this, this is a, this is, this is the crisis. That's why we founded PragerU yeah. to touch young people. And we are touching of a billion views a year. Most of them are young people, but it's still not enough. But yes. uh, it, it, it is a very terrible uh, uh, time. Yes. Yep. Yes. So Dennis, uh, these pastors that are on this, uh, this uh, gathering right now, um, the reason well, there's many reasons why I wanted you on, but one of the reasons for us as Christian pastors, we study, uh, in fact, let me put it to you this way. Um, I know, I know that most Jews by, by far avoid the New Testament. I get that. I understand that. And that's, I get it. But to the pastors that are on this call, the reality is, it's the New Testament that we find out written by Jews. New Testament declares that it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who gave the custody, the keepership, stewardship of the Bible to preserve the Bible. And the New Testament honors the Jewish people for having kept the word of God preserved that we might, we as Gentiles, enjoy it. Having said that, um, all of us as Christians, our greatest heroes are all Jews. I remember the first time I met you, you so rightly corrected me when I said, Dennis, you're my favorite Jew. And you said, that's not true. You said to me, I'm your second favorite Jew. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus, of course, was Jewish. The point is, so was Joshua. So, so was uh, David. These Jewish leaders that have shaped uh, my faith uh, is a, a hall of heroes for me. And what, is, what, what I want you to, to speak to us pastors, and think of it right now, you, you've, got, you've got now in a room, so to speak, uh, many pastors. Why, why does Dennis Prager uh, view that the Christian church has the voice? Why does Dennis Prager uh, see it important to communicate to pastors what they need to do at this time, even not only just culturally and spiritually, but even leading up to this election. How critical is it, Pastor? How serious is the moment? I believe your voice, Dennis, carries a huge amount of weight because you're speaking to us from one who loves your Old Testament. And I would never know if my New Testament's true without your people having been good custodians of the Old Testament. That's how I know the New Testament's true, is because I study the old, the old makes the promises, and the new records those promises being fulfilled. As a, as a Christian Western pastor, in this case, all of these pastors are from California. What would you say to them regarding the position that they have? Why is this a critical time? Well, I, I, and I will further comments that I made earlier. And then, and then go on to directly address what you said. First, the time that we're in. Uh, I, I never said once in my public life or even privately, that except for 2016, that the, the next election is the most important in American history or modern American history. I'm very careful about avoiding hyperbole. It's, I think it's one of the reasons I'm on radio for 35 years. I, I, I speak in a moderate voice and I, and I hate panic. I'm completely opposed to the lockdown. I was opposed to the lockdown within three weeks of it. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I said it was the biggest mistake in history. Not biggest evil, biggest mistake. I made the distinction clear. And now I, my column this week is it's gone from mistake to crime. So anyway, I'm very careful about words. The United States may not survive. It is an idea. Ideas don't uh, last forever unless they're, unless they're held 
with great firmness. And, and it's like, if I, I always think in images. So here's my image. Liberty and American values, they come in a package with a, with big letters, fragile, handle with care. Mm. It's fragile. And you, my dear fellow Americans who are Christian, you, you, you are the only, I, I don't say, I, you know, Jack, I say this on the radio. I say this to Jews. If I, if I speak to a Jewish audience, uh, if the Christians of America fail, it's over. It's just the way it is, but in, in numbers and in, and in quality and in, and in beliefs, you, you, it is on you. I mean, it's on me too. Obviously I'm fighting like crazy, but yes. it's on every American who cherishes this great country. But as a community, you're, you're the group. You can't name another community that as a community upholds the, what I call the American Trinity, liberty and God we trust, e pluribus unum. It's on every coin. I didn't make it up. I made up the term American Trinity. And you need all three. Conservative, secular conservatives forgot that you need in God we trust. They thought, oh, we, we could perpetuate America's values with reason alone. That's what they said at the university, which has become the least reasonable, most irrational place in America. It's, 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 it's voodoo. Yes. College is voodoo. Dangerous voodoo. So you are, you are it. It is fallen on you to, to wage the battle for this country because it will, it, it can be too late very soon. They are already injecting into, into high school and, and elementary curricula that you, you are taught that America was founded in 1619, this gigantic lie perpetuated by the New York Times. By the way, the, you know the people who fought it? The biggest professors who fought it are all liberal. Never Trumper, a, an anti-Trumper. Sean Wilentz, a professor of history. The, the, the most highly regarded American historians called the New York Times a liar. And they're all liberal. That's why I always distinguish between liberal and left. Liberals are usually weak, but they're not leftists. Yeah. So you, it's, it's, it's fallen on you. You, you know, we look back in history and ask, gee, why didn't the church act sooner? Why didn't Christians speak out sooner? Whatever it might be, it's easy not to speak out. So you have to, every one of us, I have to ask this question. Look, I, I'm a Jew. You, you, don't, you don't think I get flack from Jews? My, my name is anathema in, in, in uh, various synagogues. Yeah. But the Orthodox uh, hold our values because they believe the Torah is from God. That's, by the way, that is the, that is the issue. Is, is the Bible a divine document or not? That it, not do you believe in God. Do you believe in God means nothing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing. Exactly. I, I don't ask people if they believe in God because I know nothing about them. Nothing. Do you believe that any part of the Bible is divine? Any part. Is, is the Ten Commandments divine? You're on my side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well... So uh, I'm going to give a little plug to the pastors that are out there right now. You guys, I don't know if you have this book or not. It's absolutely university level, authored by Professor Dr. Wayne Grudem, who's a, who's a wonderful believer. Uh, but you guys, you, you ought to peruse this. You ought to have it, first of all. Uh, I asked Dr. Grudem to change the title of the book because I, don't, I didn't think anybody would read it. It's, it's entitled Politics According to the Bible. Uh, it should be somewhere along the more along the lines of a of a uh, holding fast to a biblical worldview, something like that. But Dr. Grudem, huge book, small print, great great layout. Dr. Grudem goes through this of every topic of our Judeo Western culture, and he answers them based upon great wisdom and biblical uh, support. But you name the topic, and he covers it here, from, from gun rights, self-defense, abortion. Should, should Christians get involved in politics? Should Christians run for office? What should be preached from the pulpit? And uh, I want to encourage all of you, again, get your hands on Wayne Grudem's book, Politics According to the Bible, a comprehensive resource for understanding modern political issues in light of the scriptures. Just a really, really great book. I encourage you to do that. Um, Dennis. 
back back to what uh, we're uh, looking uh, at. Forgive me now. one moment. I, I yeah. want to I want to endorse Wayne Grudem's book. Uh, I have had two dialogues with Wayne Grudem in Phoenix, uh, where he's at the Phoenix Seminary. By yeah. the way, I think one of them is up on the internet if you're curious, uh, which we did uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, and uh, he he. Also, there's another thing you should all be aware of. Up on the internet, he has a, a letter yes. to a never-Trumper Christian answering all of the charges against Christians for supporting uh, Donald Trump. Yes. Uh, and it, it's, uh, I have that too, by the way, but he, he's a Christian, so you might uh, want to read his, and his is longer. Because I, I have a defense of Christians who support uh, Donald Trump up on the internet too, but definitely do that. And Jack, if I may, because I, I, I think yes. there's one other book I would love to push, my, yes. my, my commentary on the Bible, uh, yes. called The Rational Bible, uh, two volumes are out, Genesis and Exodus. And I, I just want to say to you pastors, I always say to pastors, rabbis, and priests, if you don't, give, if you don't get 50, uh, um, uh, 50 sermons out of this book, I'll buy it back from you. <laughs> That's a deal. The that's Rational deal. Bible. Uh, that's a deal. Yes. Very, very good. Thank you for that, Dennis. Um, okay, because I know your time's precious and we wanna we don't want to abuse you. Um if, No, it's okay. I am I'm, I'm I'm with you till the till the hour. And if, if pastors want to ask or just you or just me, yes, I have I, I, I've dedicated this hour to you. Okay, very, very good then, because soon we're gonna go to, to uh Q and A guys. So okay, I'm gonna let the let the team know we'll be shifting over to Q&A. Uh, we'll do it a little bit differently because I don't have Gina doing that, so I'm going to try to pull this off. Um, but as, as we get ready for this, uh, in fact, you and I touched on this yesterday in the event that, that we, we uh, met at. You said something that I don't hear much from even Christians, and I was so grateful to hear you say it, that the real issue behind the dynamics of these candidates coming up in the direction of America. You said yesterday that it's a spiritual issue. It is an absolute spiritually based dynamic of what we are seeing that's being manifested in the physical realm. And I, I believe that with all my heart and it was refreshing to hear you say that. Dennis, how, and I guess I'm asking you to step into the mind of maybe like a C.S. Lewis or the authorship of the, the Screwtape Letters, but, but how would the enemy attack America if he had a chance? I, I know that Reagan has said things like this. I know that there's a great clip by, um, oh, the, the, oh my goodness, I'm drawing a blank, the great radio commentator, Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey does a great thing if I were the devil. Well, Dennis, with what you're seeing around in the spiritual foundation of it all, what's, go what's going on? What's, what's going on? There's in the no world? doubt in my mind that the battle is ultimately over Judeo-Christian values. The uh, that's why I mentioned we have a Trinity, and I take it from our our coins and bills. In God we trust, e pluribus unum, and liberty. The founders, some of whom were Trinitarian. Doc, you know, Orthodox Christians, but all of whom, whether they were or not, were deeply God-centered and Bible-centered people. Even Jefferson, you know, the famous Bible, he took out the miracles. Right. If you don't revere a book, you don't, you don't work on editing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's every one of the, Lincoln, who didn't, almost never went to church. Lincoln had a Bible on his night table. That's right. I've seen it. Uh, yes, uh, it's, this is where values come from. So you, I'll give you an example, because examples are critical with, whenever one makes a generalization. So here's one. If you, if you deny that men menstruate, you are called a hater. Yeah. The ACLU position is men menstruate. They've, they've twi tweeted it out. Men give birth. Uh, there, there was a recent CNN piece uh, with regard to cervical cancer and, and, uh, and, and getting exams for it, and, and it didn't say women. It said people with cervixes. Wow. Yeah, CNN. 
Uh, so this is a very important clue to everything. Yes. So you heard me say this, but I don't think the pastors have. So a point that I make in my commentary on Genesis, the, uh, the most important verse in the Bible, in my opinion, is 1-1. One, one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you don't believe that, the re you might as well you know, move on to uh, read uh, your yeah. latest Facebook pro post. <laughs> it's irrelevant. Yeah. But I, I, in doing the, the research the, for the commentary, I then realized, I think the second most important verse is 1-2, which nobody thinks about. And, and what it is, is, and the earth was tohu We don't know what tohu means. That's right. Nobody really knows. But it really means chaos. It means chaos. It was chaos. So here's the key. What did God do for six days? He didn't create. Only man. The next time creation is used, I believe it is only with regard to the human being. God makes order out of chaos. That's right. That's what God, God makes distinctions, night and day, day and light, land and sea, human and animal, human and God. The whole foundation of our religions is distinctions. That's order. And which distinction does God make when God makes Adam? Zachar unikeva bara uta, male and female, he created them. That's a divine distinction. Wow. The left hates divine distinctions. Man and animal, they hate that distinction. We now say it's now normal. Humans and other animals. No, it used to be humans and animals. Now it's humans and other animals. We are just an animal. And by the way, if there is no divine uh, essence in us, we are just an animal. That's entirely accurate. In the secular world, we're an animal. In the religious world, we're a human. The distinctions issue is everything. This, so what we have now is a, a force of chaos. The left, and, I, and I've studied the left since, since graduate school. Uh, that, that was my field. Very few people were in my field. I, th I thought it would become irrelevant when the, when the wall fell, when the Berlin Wall fell. It is more relevant than ever. I studied communist affairs. I studied Russian in order to be able to read Pravda. Now I study English in order to be able to read the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> the, the distinction is minimal. Minimal. I used to write for the LA Times. They no longer publish conservative opinion. There used to be column right, column left. I would write column right. It's over. That's, that's it's like decades now. They, they don't allow it. So the battle really is chaos versus divine order. That's in a nutshell what this battle is about. Very powerful. I want to um, get ready now. We're, we'll go to some questions. Before we do that, and setting this up, Dennis, I want to give a, portions of a quote. It's a lengthy quote, but it's by a, a very famous, very effective uh, American evangelist by the name of Charles Finney, and all the pastors on this call will know who Charles Finney is, and he said so long ago, and I quote, the time has come that Christians must vote for honest men and take consistent ground in politics or the Lord will curse. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this matter, but I tell you, uh, he who does but I tell you, he who sees this does see it, and he will bless or curse this nation of America according to the course that Christian leaders take on politics. And I'll, I'll cut it off there. I want all of you to understand on this call, if you're joining us for the first time, I want you to know that we are not, I am not a, what's the word, being labeled as a, um, a, a nationalist. Now, the definition in Christianity as a nationalist is to make America so great that we usher in some sort of utopian experience. That's not true. I don't believe that. Uh, people have tried to label me and others uh, on this call that we're trying to create dominionism. That's absolutely false. I believe Jesus could come back today. I believe that uh, the Lord uh, could call us home in a moment, and America will not be the salvation of the world. The Lord will be the salvation of the world. That having said that, we are to fight for what's right, 
until our time's up or until uh, it's over, whatever over means when that happens. So in light of that, because uh, as, as we have some questions coming in right now, I just, I just want you all to know, Dennis is on here today because for me, he's a motivator, a man who speaks clarity, and I love the fact that he represents our Jewish brothers and sisters. And so here we go. Uh, we have someone asking, um, what do we do if we feel that there is voter coercion in our state? If they are eliminating the poll places altogether, how can we uh, revolt against this or against this trend? I love President Trump and support him, but doesn't he have the executive power to override this? Uh, what do you I say? don't think he does. I think that the elections are state uh, law. Yeah. And we're governed in California by uh, a mediocre man with great power. That's a terrible... Yeah. Arrogance, mediocrity, and power are the roots of evil. Uh, th there is no question this whole, uh, the whole ballot thing is set up for, in order to have fraud. I mean, you have to lie to yourself to deny it. Yeah. You're going to send tens of millions of ballots to people who didn't request them. You, the, the number of ballots in every one of these instances that went to dead people, somebody got one for their dog. I mean, it, 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 you, can't, you can't do that. We should, that's what polling places are for. Yep. If people are afraid, keep the polling places open for two days, if that's necessary. Right. I, I, whatever, what I, I, look, I'm not afraid. I, I, I attend rallies. A couple of weeks ago in Chicago, I did a meet and greet before my event in Chicago. I hugged like 40 strangers. One of the reasons I'm not afraid, by the way, is, hey, we don't even, you, you have to have uh, long, prolonged contact face to face, 10 minutes minimum to 30 minutes, overwhelm it with someone who, who is uh, heavily breathing into your face. We don't, we really don't know. I mean, if I wish people did follow the science. Secondly, I'm taking hydroxychloroquine and zinc, and all of you should uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, 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 the victory rate of hydroxychloroquine and, and zinc is close to 100%. It's true. Uh, but because the president advocated it, the left is much more interested in defeating the president than keeping Americans alive. There was no doubt in my yeah. mind that Absolutely. that is how deep the hatred is. Yeah. Anyway, this you, you've raised, an, I don't know the solution. I, you, I, I think that uh, uh, it just, we have to bring to uh, our, the attention of our, our congregants and everyone else this is, this is not being done for the sake of elections. It's being done for the sake of fraudulent elections. That's right. That's right. And pastors, I want to encourage you. I know that the human emotion is in California. Why should I even vote if it's corrupt? I don't want you to take that. I'll be very blunt. That's a very carnal approach. And there's no faith in that, that, uh, that, way, that white flag you're waving. How about this? How about standing and voting a biblical worldview come election day uh, because it's the right thing to do? See, well, I don't know if we're going to win or not. I don't care about that. Stand for the right thing. Do the right thing. Because, look, we love our Bible and great exploits. Daniel says in Daniel 11.32, those who know their God shall carry out great exploits. And the God of the Bible comes through when there's just a handful of people. Uh, notice that he always moves with a handful of people in impossible situations. So don't listen to the rhetoric or even your emotions. Register to vote. Get out there and vote. Uh, but do keep this in mind, that your congregation is following you. They're following your lead, and which goes great to the next question. Listen up on this one. Do we have to address political parties at the pulpit in order to address the problems of today? The answer to that is yes. Is it necessary to discuss political parties at church? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then Dennis, jump in. Here's what I say to that. Notice that political issues I find rooted in Old and New Testament reality. For example, Isaiah was a counselor to Uzziah. Isaiah was in a political court. Daniel was in a political court. David was not only the, the, the religious hero and leader, even though he wasn't a priest, 
David had an amazing relationship with God. You find him just north of the Temple Mount before the temple was even erected, and he's got his own little tent set up. He's worshiping God, and yet he's the king. Jesus said, whose coin, whose inscription is on this coin when he was challenged about authority? And they said, Caesar's face is on that coin. And Jesus said something that every first century Jew understood. Jesus said, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And every Jew in the audience knew what he meant. Because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of all the whole earth and the universe. Jesus was announcing Caesar belongs to God. Caesar's coin belongs to God. Rome belongs to God. The empire belongs to God. So listen, rendering to Caesar is really rendering to God. And we all understand how that meets up with Romans 13. Having said that, pastor, who in your community is going to address the political issue of abortion? Who's going to address the po political issue of, of uh, gay marriage or, or gender uh, redefinition. No one's going to address it but you. You are the watchman of your community. So I refuse to have a sacred and secular division. Because I'm a believer, I believe it all falls under the sacred. And for me, even the secular issues become sacred to me. And um, that's enough of me. Dennis, what would you have to say to that? Should well, right. Yeah. So uh, this, this is... Uh... This is the way I, I address this issue. I think you can do all the good you need to do, and uh, you don't even have to mention Donald Trump in a sermon. That's right. Uh, uh, what does Donald Trump have to do with whether or not God created the human being male and female? And, I, and, I, and I, let me give you a, a real life example. In Connecticut, nearly every record in a girls, high school girls track belongs to biological males. Wow. Biological girls have, have been removed from the record books in Connecticut. We're going to have a preview video on a 16-year-old girl from Connecticut who, is, uh, who loves track and who, who runs really fast but can't compete with a male. And Idaho has a law. If you're not biologically female, you can't compete in female sports. That's the whole point of female sports. And, of course, the ACLU and the whole left is against it. Now, if you as a pastor can't address that law, wow. then, then I don't know what you could address. I mean, it, it, you don't have to. You don't have to say Democrat. You don't have to say Republican. You don't have to say Donald Trump. You know, you'll you'll all find this very interesting. So, uh, the Prague University is is quite successful, thank God. Not mm -hmm. successful enough because we may lose the country. But anyway, if you have a billion views a year and sixty five percent of them are are under thirty five, you're you're doing something right. So the New York Times had a front page piece on PragerU, the LA Times front page uh, piece on me and PragerU, and uh, BuzzFeed and Mother Jones, front page pieces on, on us. And they all mentioned, to their very great chagrin, but not one PragerU video is about Donald Trump. It drives them crazy. Mm. And uh, we, we know how to be effective, and I want you to be effective. You don't, you don't have to wear a MAGA hat while you give your sermon. In fact, I don't think you should. Uh, 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 I don't want the left uh, wearing a Biden hat in their, in their services. But you, you, if, if we can't fight the issues uh, without saying the word Democrat, then, and, and without the audience understanding the, the obvious political implications, then we have failed. Yeah. The issues are enormous. Do you believe, give a sermon on this, do you believe that what Lincoln said is true? We're the last best hope on earth? There you go. Yes or no? If, uh, but if you go to school today, you will not only think we're, we're, we're not the last best hope, we're, we're worthless. Do you know, do you know, I mean, it's, we, we present these facts. It's very important for all of you. You've got to master some of these facts. The United States got 3% of the slaves from Africa that came to the Western world. 
3%. 97% went to South America and the Caribbean. Why aren't they marching against Brazil? 12 million slaves. America got 340,000 versus 12 million, 340,000. And we're, we're the racist country. Why isn't Brazil? Why isn't every Caribbean country? Why, why, aren't, why isn't the Arab world, which had more slaves than the Western world from Africa, why aren't there more? If you attack the Arab Muslim world for slavery, you're an Islamophobe. You're exactly it's all right. anti-American. It has nothing to do with slavery. Nothing. And slavery is the excuse. Dennis, sorry to interrupt. How many Americans know that the actual Amazon of that day for slaves was the Muslim Barbary Coast pirates? They're the ones that captured the North Africans and put them on the market, but you're not allowed to say that. And they were even more, that's correct, and they were even more in East Africa. Yep, absolutely. Wow, listen, okay, great answer. Uh, here's, a, here's a good one. Uh, and again, you can. we're in California, here's the deal. Someone's asking the question, how can we protect our vote? Is ballot harvesting bad? Why would we do that at church? Okay, I can answer that effectively. Uh, very much so. Number one, how do you protect your vote? We're specifically talking about California. How do you protect your vote in California? And uh, how, is ballot harvesting bad? Ballot harvesting is a disaster. It was invented by the Democrat Party in California, and uh, it almost makes their effort to win an election foolproof, okay? But let me tell you what happened. We wound up taking that bad law, which is in effect. They actually do it. And us good guys, we don't, we don't engage in it. Well, what happened was in the last special election in the 25th district with um, Mike Garcia. Is it Mike Garcia, 25th? I think it's Mike Garcia in the 25th district. Uh, what we did was as a church, Calvary Chapel Chino Hills, we changed the word from... Uh, vote or ballot harvesting, we, turned, we changed it to ballot collection. And we went into the 25th district to help the election of, of Mike Garcia. And what happened was uh, we did what the rules allow. And guess what happened? Mike Garcia won in an overwhelming election, Republican, first, first Republican to hold that seat in forever. And now he's in Washington, DC. We do it here at this church. We call it again, ballot collection, which means this, everybody in the region, it's announced to everyone, bring your ballot to the church. We will, you can stand and watch it. We box it up. We lock it up and we take it by caravan. Uh, I'm not going to add how, how else we protect it, but it goes, you can even follow the vehicles if you'd like, all the way to the office of the registrar's office for, for your ballot to be delivered safely. We have taken a very bad law that they made, and we are using it in a holy way to make sure that your vote counts. We don't tamper with your vote. We don't touch your envelope. We don't mess with it. The bizarre thing is in California, the Democrats passed that in their supermajority powers to create ballot harvesting to manipulate the, the vote and what we did is just guarantee that the good people we know voting, we make sure that their vote arrives safely and we'll be doing it again. And so that's how you take, it's Isaiah chapter 10, I think it is. It says, woe unto those who write misfortune for the people and bring bad laws upon the land, Isaiah 10, 1. And so what we've done is we've taken the law, Paul the Apostle would appreciate this, we've taken the law and we've used it righteously. So, Dennis, you want to make comments about that? No, that was great. God bless you. Okay. Uh, I just, yeah, let me just say it. one overriding yeah. thing. Uh, you, you are, you're an exemplar of, of a rule of life that I, I came up with many years ago. Good people are divided into three groups. Those who fight, those who help the fighters, and those who do nothing. The third group is, is the largest. Mm. And uh, I'm a fighter and you're a fighter, and it would seem to me every one of us who takes God and the Bible seriously has to be a fighter. At the very least, help the fighters. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's, that's, 
otherwise, let me let me share something. This is very powerful to me. I, I don't know if it's, I think it'll be powerful to all of you. There's a man I profoundly admire. There are, there are quite a number of them. Jack Hibbs is one of them. But one who uh, may who has a who you may know of, Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Jordan Peterson is a Canadian professor of psychology. He's a fighter. He's brilliant and he's a fighter. He was a guest at a PragerU uh, gala, which we, prior to the lockdown, we had two of them a year. We had Charles Krauthammer right before he got uh, ill and then uh, sadly passed away. We had Jordan Peterson. And you can watch my dialogue with Jordan Peterson. It's on YouTube. It's very moving. I asked him if he believed in God. Uh, he's, not, he's not a practicing Christian. Uh, but I asked him, do you believe in God? And, he, and I'm paraphrasing. You, you could actually watch the answer on, on YouTube. What he said shook me up. I don't get shaken up because I've been dialoguing with people for a, a lifetime. But it shook me up. And he said, I don't know if I'm good enough to say I believe in God. Because mm. if you believe in God, the demands on you are so great. Mm. And I, I almost have tears repeating this. It, it, he's so right. What does it mean? I ask all of you, what does it mean to believe in God? Mm. If it doesn't play out, I mean, obviously, you know, th this is, you know, a sentiment in, in James, obviously, it's a sentiment in the Old Testament. I, if, if it, in the Old Testament, to, to believe in God means to obey him. That, that's, that's the definition of belief, not I believe. I believe means nothing, as I said earlier. It's true. How does it translate? And if it doesn't translate now into fighting for this, the one Judeo-Christian country on earth, then then what is its use? Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Real quick. Um, great. By the way, great questions. Listen to this one coming up. Um, there are many pastors out there using Romans 13 to justify not opening their churches. Can you elaborate on how we counter argue these pastors? By the way, they're, they are the same pastors that say we should not talk about politics in the church. You are, listen, whoever wrote this, you are, you're anonymous. That's okay. You are exactly 100% true. That's been my experience. Let me answer this very fast. You mentioned Romans 13. Here it comes. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God and those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. Listen, verse 3. For rulers are, a, are not a terror to good works, but evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what's good, and you will have the praise, a praise from the same. This is key. To answer your question, Pastor, uh, I, I'm, I can only speak. This is one reporter's opinion. Uh, we had no intentions to close the door of our church at all. Then Donald Trump ca came out and so nice, I was a little upset because he asked so nice, closed, can you close everything down for 15 days? Let's flatten the curve. I reluctantly did that. We kept preaching online. We added services, but all of it is online. I complied with Romans 13. That was my spirit. That was my, that was my intentions. And that was my source text is what you're looking at. And then he asked us for another 15 days, and I didn't like it whatsoever, and I grudgingly did that. When Trump handed authority over to the governors after those total of 30 days, that's when I began to fast and pray, and that's when the Lord made it very clear to me, open up the church. And for me to say, Lord, I'm, okay, I'm going to do it, he gave me this confidence. Remember, Jesus said, behold, I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. He said that to the church at Philadelphia in the book of Revelation. And so number one, pastors, Romans 13 applies. I obeyed Romans 13. I can look at God in the face and say, Lord, I obeyed Romans 13. But I also, listen, everybody, pastors, listen. I also obeyed Acts chapter 4 and 5 when 
the authorities said, you know what? No more preaching in the name of Jesus. This doctrine of this resurrected Christ has turned Jerusalem upside down and will have none of it. And they were, the disciples were beaten. They were told not to speak anymore. And then they were turned loose. And the Bible says that the disciples went away from the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were found worthy to be persecuted for the gospel's sake. Here's the deal. Pastors want to hide behind Romans 13 and and not obey Acts chapter 4 and 5. This is impossible. The same pastors, you are correct. You said the same pastors who say, don't get involved in politics, are the same ones that have their doors shut today. That's a 100% clear observation. Every church I know that is open right now to the glory of God and fearing God more than man that church is prospering. Hey, listen, pastors, we had 13,000 people here last weekend. We had 26, 2,700 people here last night. We had 26 decisions for faith. We have a baptism coming up and it's gonna be about 600 people are being baptized out of the Pacific Ocean. Why? Because we're open. Just because we're open preaching the truth. This is the hour when Jesus said, I've set before you an open door, pastors, open your doors. You have got to take advantage of this God-given moment. COVID, COVID may be the topic, topic issue of the day, but the church has capitalized on the opportunity. People are fearful, scared. I was just told eight people in association with our congregation, eight people will be burying their 18 to 28-year-olds, eight of them. Eight of their children committed suicide for a lack of hope. Church needs to be open. And then I'm going to end with this. Romans tells you that the authorities that are in power are to uh, promote and maintain that which is good. I submit to you today that closing your church's doors is not good. Um, Someone says here, great question. Wait, can I I comment on that? Oh, go for it. I'd like to uh, ask those who say uh, that uh, Romans 13 precludes uh, them from opening up their church or or whatever they might do that disobeys Gavin Newsom or Eric Garcetti. I'd like to ask, and and this uh, is a serious question. It's not not over the top. It's a serious question. If it, at, at what point is a Christian mandated to violate uh, uh, secular law. Uh, if Gavin Newsom said, throw Hebrew babies into mm. the Pacific, would, would you obey? Wow. Uh, why isn't uh, that uh, chapter in Exodus uh, also uh, 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 determinative? And the, uh, the midwives who, as I point out in my commentary, clearly were, were, uh, were Egyptian, not Hebrew. Uh, they, uh, it says, it's, it's, I'm only saying this because some of you may know Hebrew. Uh, the, the, uh, the midwives feared God. Mm. Screw Pharaoh. Okay, sorry for the vernacular. That was their attitude. Pharaoh's law is not my law. God's law is my law. Also, is, isn't this the crisis of the church in Germany uh, in the 30s? The Nazis were in charge, so so therefore what? Therefore, it, it, is it conceivable to any of you that Paul would come back and say, yeah, you, you got to listen to uh, the Nazis? Paul would have been killed. <laughs> he would have been sent to the gas chambers. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, we must vote vertically. Shouldn't we show our attenders which party's policies best align with biblical values? Hey, listen, not only are you correct, Dennis said it earlier, it's exactly what we do here, and we will help you, by the way. Faith and Public Policy, our real impact, .gov ministry will help you. I will do a series of sermons leading up to the election, and you'll be able to sit in the congregation, and I'm not going to have Biden's face or Trump's face. I'm not going to have Biden's name or Trump's name. I'm going to go down the the policies of the platform, just the platform. And I'm going to show you one platform, 
the other platform and God's word. And you'll be able to draw lines and circle which one's most biblical. And you'll be able to, with, with an educated mind, an informed mind, conclude what is what world value do you espouse? Apply that world value to your vote. And if you are a Christian or a Jew and you know your scriptures, it is a no-brainer. You will have to vote your conscience. You will have to vote your worldview. And you'll be happy to know that it's, I've never seen it more clearly defined than this, these two platforms right now. It is just on the issue of life, pro-life alone is off the charts. One party is an affront, an abomination to God for human sacrifice in the womb. The other party stands without doubt the most pro-life party that we've seen in modern times of our, of our nation. So Dennis, any comment on that? Well, you, you said it well. Also, pe people need to understand the inner price one pays for moral compromise. Uh, I do. I, I believe it. It literally. I mean, in other words, physically. I think it eats you up. Uh, you know how many parents are afraid of their children. Ugh. It, it, it's. I know it because I, I've been blessed to talk to millions of people every day and a, a, an incredible variety of them call in and, and the, what do I, what do I, you know, I'm afraid my kid will stop talking to me if they know where I stand. What kind of kid is that? It's a bad kid. By the way, I, I, I'm sorry, Jack, but I, yeah. I, 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 I lapse into Bible stuff, <laughs> but if I can't do it with, with all of you, then I can never do it. But I do it on my <laughs> secular radio show. So I have about 10,000 words on the Ten Commandments in my, in my commentary in Exodus. It's, it's the most important seg segment, I believe, yeah. uh, in, in the, uh, at least in the Old Testament. And uh, I've always asked, what do, you think, what do you think is the most important of the Ten Commandments? People love to ask that. And I've gone through different phases in my life. Now it's honor your father and mother. Every cult, and the left is a cult, every cult's first task is to sever parental authority. Yeah. Because parental authority is the gateway to divine authority. Yes. My father is above me, then the father in heaven is above him and me. It's the way, it's the way it works. They hate they hate divine authority. They hate parental authority. They hate police authority. They hate teacher authority. Mm. So they hate pastor's authority. Mm -hmm. So you have to be strong. Your task is not to be liked by your congregants. If all of your congregants like you, it's a problem. Yes. I, 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 I mean, it. if all of my listeners like me, it's a problem. I've never once said a thing in 35 years so that my listeners like me. So take same-sex marriage, okay? I have a niece who is a lesbian. She is married to a woman. They have two kids. I love my niece. I, I love her partner. I love her children. And they love me, and they know I am opposed to same-sex marriage on religious grounds. They never said, you are no longer our uncle because you hold that position. Any more than I would, God forbid, say, you're no longer my niece because you're, you're a married lesbian. Right. I love them. I, my wife and I are godparents to a gay couple's kids. They know we're against same-sex marriage, but they want us to be the moral guides of their children if wow. they die. Wow. If you are true to what you say and it is completely devoid of any anger or hate, then you will be honored. Dennis, that was awesome. Just that alone right there made this, made this call. Well, it took you, a while. You, wow. We, I just got in with one minute to in. go. I got, we, I got the. <laughs> we were waiting. We were waiting. No, was, what, what you just said, the, the hour, pastor, the hour is upon us. You've been called to the pulpit ministry of the Lord to shine the light. Jesus, this is something I'm still grappling with. One of the greatest pursuits of my life now after becoming a follower of Christ and a pastor is trying to reconcile what he said. When you look at, you ask anybody on the street, 
even if it's just rumored, who's the most loving individual that has ever graced the earth? People will say, Jesus. Then how is it that he's the most hated person on earth? You mention the name Jesus and people will either hug you or, or punch you. Here's the thing I'm trying to figure out. Jesus said, because you love me, others will hate you. And they will, they will mock you. They will ridicule you. They will persecute you. He said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But by your association with me, you will be hated. And so that's what I'm trying to reconcile as a pastor in the 21st century. To me, to truly be biblical is to, I love what Dennis said a moment ago, to be in every, every possible lifestyle of this, of this humanity represented for that group of people to say, any group of people to say, you know what, I can't stand that guy. I can't stand what he believes, but he loves me. I love him. I'm trying to be the most loving individual on the planet because I want to be radicalized by the Holy Spirit for Jesus' sake. If I'm radicalized by God, I'm going to be the most loving person the world's ever seen. But hey, look, I don't live in a bubble. Jesus said, if you do that, you're going to be hated. Pastors, I'm asking you to galvanize your pulpit around the word of God. And I know that you do that if you're on this call, but also this, that you so stand for what is true, that you are able to take the criticism. I pray that if social media has the ability to get inside your head and make you feel bad or recoil back from truth, then, then listen, then just stick to the Bible and get off social media. But when somebody criticizes you and it causes you to, to wither, get away from it. Give the truth, stand with the truth, and here's the closeout. People will rally behind leadership, especially at this time. God made you, Pastor, to be a shepherd of that flock. Someone asked the question, how can a little flock or a little church like ours get involved in this process? I, uh, Sheila, I took a picture of your, of your comment. We're going to be reaching out to you. But standing firm, people will, will rally to the truth. Dennis, you stand firm. We love you. I got a text a moment ago from a first generation born Egyptian pastor in Los Angeles County, Pastor James Cadiz speaks fluent Hebrew, fluent uh, Arabic, English. And he says, please tell Dennis that the pastors in my generation are proud of him and love him. Please tell him this young pastor is the first generation of this country from Egypt and that I love him with all of my heart. Wow. Like, that is an awesome, awesome thing. That's the, that's the connection truth does in our lives. Dennis, closing words. To that pastor, first of all, Alf Shukran, a thousand thanks in Arabic. My friends, uh, it's not fun to be tested. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't enjoy fighting, okay? I enjoy Beethoven. I enjoy my wife and kids. I enjoy my friends. I love life. So I have a book on happiness. I don't, however, get to choose the times I live in. Mm. This, this is the way it is. And I'll end with this. I took a vow. and I've I don't take vows. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very tough thing. It's, it's a mixed bag taking vows. Anyway, I, I took a vow many years ago at Normandy Beach. Mm. And I saw thousands of crosses there. The average age of the guy buried there was 20. Horrible death, the machine guns of the Nazis. And this is the vow that I took. These guys could die for freedom and for America. So I will live for freedom and America. Nobody's asking me to storm machine guns. I have a wonderful personal life. But the least I could do was live as a fighter. I don't have to die as a fighter. They did. But that's it. That's the vow I took. Because mm. if I don't fight, then I'm really saying every one of those deaths was, was pointless. You, you died for liberty. 
I'm not going to even live for liberty. Well, so what are you doing? What is the, is the purpose of life to play it safe? Is that what you want? Is that what I want on my tombstone? Here lies Dennis Prager. He, he played it safe. Mm. I, I, I don't want that epitaph. So this is, this is the time. This is the time. It, 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 it could easily be too late soon. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So that's, that's my final words. God bless you, Jack. God bless you, Dennis. God bless all of you, pastors. Stay strong. Look up. Our redemption draws near. Dennis, we love you. We'll see you soon. I don't know where, but we'll see you soon. God bless you, my friend. Bye-bye.